Hello everyone. The 16th century. From Europe, thousands and thousands of men in search of adventure and fortune embarked on sailing vessels to explore the world and exploit it or conquer it for better or worse. The fascination and the excitement were intense for the riches and wonders of India, China, Persia, the Spice Islands, or a mysterious archipelago east of China called Sipango, Japan, mentioned by Marco Polo more than 200 years before. The sheer size and mystery of Africa with its deep forests, mountain chains and deserts, and its gold and ivory, all of this was beginning to unveil to Europeans. And in the West, a Spanish expedition led by Christopher Columbus had reached what appeared to be a new continent, a land that was increasingly called West Indies, the New World, or America. A land where the Spaniards had begun to build an empire for themselves, on a vast and diverse space where strange civilizations had flourished long before they arrived and from which they had begun to bring inconceivable quantities of gold and silver. This new world was vast, terrifying and exciting in equal measure, and its mysteries had barely been unveiled. What other wonders or treasures were hidden in the depth of the Amazonian forest, at the turn of a trail in the Andes Mountains, near the pyramids of Mexico, or the deserts and plains of North America. It seemed that medieval rumors or legends that told of places in the West where gold was abandoned, or even entire cities of gold, may be true, after all. And this early exploration of America, the excitement for its promises, the encounter and subjugation of empires that owned large quantities of gold, like the Aztecs and the Incas, all of this was fertile soil for new myth to develop. One of the most enduring in Europe and among colonists in the New World, in the 16th and 17th centuries, was the myth of El Dorado, the Golden One, a hypothetical land, or a city, where gold was so abundant that you could just pick it on the ground, and together with it, the myth of the seven cities of gold, seven hidden cities where houses, monuments, or even streets were said to be made of pure gold and that waited to be found somewhere. For decades, expeditions were sent, many of them returned empty-handed some of them disappeared. But it seems these mysterious places remained undiscovered. Tonight, we are going to explore this myth, how they appeared, because for a part they were based on legends that existed even before Columbus reached America. What the Spanish conquest of America was like, or the arrival of the Portuguese in Brazil. We will follow the trail of some of these expeditions across America and see how the quantity of precious metal that was found there 
changed the world, even though it didn't come from El Dorado or the cities of gold. So, please adopt a comfortable position, because we are just at the beginning of a long journey. As always, you have timestamps on your screen and in the description, or in the first comment pinned under this video. In the same comment, you will find links to Spotify or Apple Music or Amazon Music, if you wish to listen to my stories there. There are dozens available on each of these platforms. It seems some of you only find the last ones, but no, they are all available if you go to my profile page and click on All Albums or Full Discography. Also in this pinned comment, you will find a link to my Patreon page. If you wish to support this channel, help keep it free of ad breaks, and get the associated perks like the downloads, news and the possibility to listen to all stories as podcasts, with or without background sounds. Now, take a deep breath. Try to let the tension go in your body especially in your shoulders. And let's begin our little historical tour. I told you that before Christopher Columbus reached America, there had been legends, especially in Portugal, about cities, lost cities in the West. Actually, Columbus did not explore the continent itself, the mainland. In total, he made four voyages across the Atlantic Ocean. In the first voyage, the Discovery One, it seems the first islands he reached were in the Bahamas, and he went on to the coasts of Cuba and Santo Domingo. In the second one, that immediately followed, he explored more of the Caribbean, and only in the third and fourth voyages, he sailed along the coasts of the mainland, near Guyana and Central America. This happened between 1492 and 1504, twelve years rich in discoveries, and the elaboration of the first maps. But Columbus stayed on the coasts. He did not explore inland like his successors would. As you certainly know, Columbus worked for the kings of Spain, who funded his journeys. But he was Italian, from Genoa. The reasons why Spain employed him were several, and they are important to understand the mindset at the time. Obviously, there was the appeal of discovery, the curiosity for what the world was like. There was also a search for prestige, but maybe more importantly, this was an investment with uncertain, but potentially enormous, profits in return. Spain had noted how the Portuguese, decades earlier, along the 15th century, had begun to explore the Atlantic and the coasts of Africa. The Portuguese had founded small island colonies in the Atlantic, and from their African trade, they extracted significant profits. Still nothing in comparison with what they would earn when they would pass the southern tip of Africa to explore the Indian Ocean and go as far as Japan in the 16th century. 
but still enough to validate the idea that exploration could be lucrative. And when it came to trade, nothing could be more lucrative than finding a way to directly reach Asia by the sea. India, China, the islands where spices were harvested in Southeast Asia. This would mean trading directly with these regions, instead of being the end client for goods that had traveled in the hands of Asian and Middle Eastern merchants and arrived in Europe with very inflated prices. The theory that the Earth was round meant that it should be possible to reach East Asia traveling westward instead of only eastward. And this was the theory that Columbus' voyages were based on. For several years, it was believed, including by Columbus himself, that these islands he had reached were parts of Asia, of Las Indias, or the Indies, as they were called. So it was not the only reason, but these expeditions were definitely for profit, and profit there would be. Columbus led the bases of colonialism in several Caribbean islands. He sent back a bit of gold and slaves to Spain, slaves coming from America. And along the 16th century, Profits from the conquest and the exploitation of the new continent reached highs that the Spanish could not even have dreamed of before. When the Aztec Empire was subjugated around 1520, and later the Incas in South America, the treasures that were confiscated and sent to Spain were enormous entire ships full of gold and precious artifacts, and even more gold and silver would be extracted from New World mines along the 16th and 17th centuries, with gems, jade and colonial crops. A lot was also spent on the colonies, and even more lost in corruption and European wars. The Kingdom of Spain really struggled to retain that wealth. It actually declared itself bankrupt several times, despite this. Nine times precisely, from 1557 to 1666. And this despite the constant inflow of precious metals. But for individuals across Europe at the time, what mattered was that this new world could produce inconceivable quantities of gold, of wealth, for those brave enough or foolish enough to explore and seize what they could. Beyond the macroeconomic implications of such an inflow of gold, or issues of public finance, America appeared as a promised land for those dreaming of a quick fortune and adventure. From Europe or from the American settlements that the colonists had established in the New World, they could read the first accounts and chronicles written by travelers, telling of what they had discovered, what the conquest had been like, or what they had been told by the natives. There were a lot of indirect testimonies and exaggerations that contributed to establish legends and turn simple rumors into almost certainties or beliefs. It is in this context that the term El Hombre Dorado, the Golden Man, or El Rey Dorado, the Golden King, appeared, 
in the 16th century, the first decades of Spanish presence. It quickly became just El Dorado and came to name a mythical city or kingdom, but initially it was a person, and this term was inspired by the narrative of a ritual, an initiation ritual, that took place in present-day Colombia, a ritual of the Muisca people. It was told in one of the early chronicles written in Spanish about the conquest of America that the king of the Muisca was covered with gold dust from head to toe and then immersed himself in a lake, washing off the gold as his attendants threw objects made of gold and emeralds as offerings to their gods. Did this ritual really exist? It is uncertain, but what is true is that the Muisca culture did have a lot of gold and precious stones, certainly enough to impress the Spanish. They are less famous than the Aztecs or the Incas, because they didn't have a large empire and they didn't leave monumental architecture on the same scale. But the Muisca culture formed a confederation in the north of the Andes Mountains, around the region of Bogota, the modern capital of Colombia. Many aspects of this culture are mysterious, because it didn't leave its own records. It is known through Spanish chronicles that were not always very trustworthy. They always reflected the point of view of 16th century conquistadors or travelers or clergymen. And for a more solid base through archaeology. But what is established is that around the time of their first contacts and conquests, the years 1530, the Muisca had a significant population. Estimates vary from half a million to three million. And they lived on agriculture, obviously, with a quite advanced knowledge of metalworking and mining. They mined salt too, not just metals. They came from cultures that had developed in this part of Colombia starting thousands of years earlier. So, returning to this golden king, it is uncertain whether this ritual existed or not, or under a different form. But to Europeans, the complete disregard for the value of gold, this way of losing it as an offering to the gods, was completely mind-blowing and could only mean that these people had gold in very large quantities. And here we touch on a big difference in the perceived value of gold between pre-Columbian cultures and Europeans at the time. To all technically advanced pre-Columbian civilizations that had mastered mining and metalworking, Gold was precious. It served to make jewelry, ornaments, luxury goods. It was a valuable offering to the gods, so by no means it was seen as one metal among others. It was special. But they also had access to some in quantities that Europeans were unfamiliar with. It was not as rare as it was for the Europeans. In a recent story about medieval treasures, I told you about the scarcity of gold and silver during the European Middle Ages. These precious metals were scarce because there was not much production in Western and Central Europe. There were a few mines, but the deposits were smaller 
than what would later be found in America, Africa or Australia. They had been exploited for a long time, the time of the Roman Empire or even before. So Europe was not a significant producer of gold and silver. And on top of this, with the passing of time, precious metals tended to exit Europe, to go out, because in its trade relations with the rest of the world, especially with the Muslim world in the Middle East and North Africa, Europe was a net importer of goods. The value of what it bought was structurally higher than what it had to sell, and somehow the difference had to be paid, paid in gold and silver. This made gold rare and highly valuable in Europe, maybe more valuable than anywhere else in the world at the time, relatively at least to the value of goods and assets. And this scarcity cemented the reputation of gold as the ultimate sign of wealth, of value. This perception lasted well beyond the Middle Ages, into the 16th and 17th centuries for sure. So even though gold was precious and special to pretty much all cultures that knew it around the world, for its rarity and its shine, it was even more the case for European explorers at the time, to a point that was not understandable by pre-Columbian cultures. So, if a king threw away gold dust and jewels, like the story said, it could only mean that he had access to huge quantities of this metal and lived in a land where it was abandoned. From El Dorado as a person, the term came to name a mythical place, maybe a city or a kingdom, or a region, where gold would be abandoned. And this was rather credible, because the conquerors of Mesoamerica, of the Aztecs, or the Incas in the Andes Mountains, had sent back to Spain entire vessels loaded with gold and other treasures. It did not seem to be such a stretch of the imagination to think that this could be replicated in other places. And to add credibility to the existence of such a city or land, the hypothesis echoed legends that existed from before the time of Columbus. Legends about lost cities somewhere to the west. What were these legends? In uh, Iberia, Spain and Portugal, there had been for centuries a legend about an island called Antilia which originated in the Middle Ages. It said that at the time of the Muslim conquest of the Iberian Peninsula, in the 8th century, seven Christian bishops would have escaped on ships with their flocks and sailed westward into the Atlantic Ocean to escape the invaders. They would have eventually landed on an island, Antilia, where they would have founded seven settlements, seven cities. And since then, these seven cities would have lost contact with Europe and the rest of Christendom. Now these legends about a mythical island somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean are even older than the 8th century. They already existed since at least classical antiquity. There were tales of utopian islands to the west in different Greek works, like the Fortunate Islands, 
a place referred to by Homer that would have been a, an earthly paradise inhabited by the heroes of Greek mythology. Or Atlantis, this mythical kingdom or continent that Plato first talked about as a fictional location for a story, but that was picked up and thought to be a real place several centuries after. So the idea already circulated in ancient Greece, and later the Romans adopted it. It was not purely fictional, there were real elements that could validate it, like the existence of the Canary Islands, of the coast of Africa, that were known to the Romans. And actually the name Canary Islands does not come from canaries, the birds, but from canis, Latin for dog. It means the island of dogs. So these antique legends about one or several mysterious islands west of Europe already existed. And when they have been around for a long time, legends begin to sound true, with or without a real factual basis. In medieval Europe, these myths endured, often in a new Christian version, and they were not limited to Spain and Portugal. In Ireland, for example, there were the Imrama, tales of sea journeys that tell of legendary Atlantic islands. And of course the Norse sagas that told of journeys to the west, and the discoveries of Greenland and Vinland in North America that brought credibility to the existence of lands west of Europe. The Iberians, too, had concrete elements that made these stories plausible. Apart from the Canaries and Madeira, the Portuguese found the Assos far into the Atlantic. So during their age of exploration, in the 15th century, the legend of Antilia and its seven cities grew in popularity. The island of Antilia was never found, but it started to appear on maps, generally as a rectangle of land in different parts of the ocean, depending on the map. We would find it a bit unprofessional today for a cartographer, but putting things on maps that had not been measured or even proven was not uncommon at the time. Apart from Antilia, it also happened in the 16th century on maps of America. The location of El Dorado was put on the maps where it was rumored to be. I will tell you later about these locations. This did not happen that much on the more serious maps that were made for explorers and kings. And in the 16th or 17th centuries, the maps were very precious documents that were kept secret. You didn't want to let others know of the routes you had discovered and the colonies you had established overseas. So the Portuguese and the Spanish kept their maps for themselves. But other maps of the world, less precise and more colorful, began to be printed for a broader audience, often coming with the accounts, the chronicles, of journeys to America, Africa, or Asia. These maps were how the general public began to figure out what the world looked like beyond Europe. But seeing El Dorado or the island of Antilia on them could only give credibility to their myth 
and this was another reason that made their existence plausible. So in the excitement of the treasures that had been seized, and imagining what remained to be found, searching for El Dorado, or the seven lost cities, sounded reasonable, or at least worth investigating and taking risks. The seven cities supposedly founded on the island of Antilia became seven cities of gold in America in the years following the conquest of Mexico in the 1520s and 1530s, about 30 years after the first voyage of Columbus. A rumor of imprecise or unknown origin began to spread among the Spaniards now staying in Mexico, called New Spain at the time. A rumor saying that these seven cities would be located hundreds of miles to the north, which would have put them somewhere in the north of modern Mexico or the southwest of the United States. The rumors were largely fed by reports from the survivors of an expedition to Florida that had shipwrecked. And when the survivors returned to New Spain, they said that the natives had told them stories about cities with great wealth, almost unlimited wealth. Later, in 1539, an Italian explorer went far north, as far north as Suni Pueblo in modern New Mexico. And he came back speaking of extraordinary treasures there. An expedition was sent to this place, but when they arrived, they only found adobe and straw villages. The promised golden cities were nowhere to be found. But this same expedition, as they were near Suni Pueblo, heard an additional rumor from the natives about a city with plenty of gold located on the other side of the Great Plains. And the leader of this expedition, Coronado, decided to check. They crossed the Great Plains and arrived to what is supposed to be modern Kansas, Nebraska, or Missouri. But here again, no city of gold was found. So the expedition finally returned to New Spain, disappointed. The seven cities of gold remained elusive. But the fact that they were not found did not mean they did not exist. It even added to the mystery and the appeal of the rumor. So the story of the legendary seven cities endured in New Spain among colonists and it traveled back to Europe where it excited people's imagination. Even though the real origin of the legend might well be somewhere in Portugal and Spain where the legend of Antilia and its seven cities had been present long before the exploration of the New World. But the seven cities were never as famous as El Dorado, which began to be referenced as a wealthy kingdom remaining to be discovered about at the same time in the 1530s. This rumor only intensified the search for gold in South America that had begun a few years before by different explorers and their expeditions. These expeditions were not just Spanish or Portuguese. News of the discovery of a western route to a new world and of the Portuguese explorations around Africa and beyond, had spread quickly at the beginning of the 16th century. In a matter of years, 
The kings of England and France also sent their expeditions across the Atlantic. They were willing to discover their own routes, maybe to China, by the West, or claim new lands. But the people participating in all these expeditions came from different countries. There were many Italians, starting with Columbus, employed by different kingdoms because they were good sailors. There were also Germans and Dutch. In the 16th century, the crown of Spain became part of the Habsburg Empire under Charles V, who ruled at the same time over Spain, Austria, Burgundy, the Low Countries, and had interests everywhere in Germany, since he was also Holy Roman Emperor and in Italy. So to an extent, traders, explorers, adventurers from Germany or Italy also were involved. For example, the first expeditions inland of what became Venezuela, in search of gold and other riches, happened by the end of the 1520s by agents of a German banking family, the Welser family, that had received a concession from the King of Spain to exploit this region. Apart from Mexico, which had been recently conquered, this was one of the first regions where expeditions were sent deep inland to discover what existed beyond the coastline. The Orinoco River was explored, but these first expeditions did not succeed in finding large quantities of gold or even large cities like the ones found in Mexico. The encounters with the natives were often violent, the climate was also hostile, and between the diseases and uh, the uh, harassment of native tribes, many died, and these expeditions did not achieve more than recognize the land and draw maps. But this didn't discourage explorers, quite the opposite, because in the 1530s, the legend of El Dorado had uh, taken shape based on this Muisca initiation ritual that I told you about earlier. The Golden One, the Muisca King, had become the Golden City in people's imagination. And the search only intensified. In and around Colombia, the Muisca land, as I said earlier, was in central Colombia around the city of Bogota. Until the years 1530, there had been contacts with the Muisca and other peoples in the north of South America, but no conquest like in Mexico. America was vast, and between the distances and the limited number of men, the capacity to conquer was limited. In the 1530s, this changed. The Aztecs had fallen in Mexico, and the Spanish were now looking to the south. They had arrived at the Inca border in 1528. And after years of preliminary exploration and a few skirmishes, the conquest really began in 1532. A group of a few dozen soldiers, not more, with their indigenous allies, ambushed an Inca force and captured the emperor, the Sapa Inca, Atahualpa, at the Battle of Cajamarca in the north of Peru. This move completely stunned the Incas. Thousands were massacred without a single dead on the Spanish side. And this was the start of the campaign that saw the largest pre-Columbian empire subjugated. It fell quickly, 
but it took about 40 years to entirely pacify it. The conquest was achieved by no more than a few thousand Spanish, even though they were helped by native peoples revolting against the Incas, and also a war of succession that was taking place within the Inca Empire when they launched the offensive. While this was happening in Peru, the invaders actually did not come directly from Mexico, my land, because no route through Colombia and Ecuador had been established yet. They came by sea, sailing south of South America through the Strait of Magellan, reaching the Pacific Ocean, and then back north all the way up to Peru. Colombia was hard to travel by land, and it remained mysterious apart from a few expeditions that had ventured into it. And even more mysterious was this gigantic forest south of Venezuela and east of the Andes, a forest that would soon be known as the Amazonian forest. But land routes had to be explored and opened. So in 1536, a Spanish conquistador, Quesada, and an army of 800 men were sent on a mission to find an overland route to Peru. But Spanish conquerors were rather independent from the authorities. They received missions and promises of titles and their share of the booty. But there was no one to check on them during the month or years they explored, far from the eyes of the authorities. So when Quesada was sent to find this overland path to Peru, instead he was drawn away from the mission by the stories about El Dorado, and decided to go conquer the land of the Muisca, which he did, and he seized their treasures. But even though it was a lot already, there was not this abundance of gold that the rumors had talked about. Once there, he received reports from captured natives about a kingdom whose inhabitants had built a temple to the sun and filled it with an enormous quantity of gold and jewels. He tried to look for it for another year, but was not successful. Still, Quesada did not renounce easily. The Golden King legend of the Muisca involved a king and a lake, where, supposedly, precious artifacts had been thrown for centuries. So he could search for the lake and see if some of these uh, treasures could be retrieved. The Muisca did have a sacred lake, and the ritual did exist indeed, at least to some extent. The lake was found in 1537. Lake Guatavita. But it looked too large and deep, and the bottom too muddy to recover anything. However, eight years later, in 1545, two other conquistadors attempted to drain the lake. The only way they could think of was to organize a chain of laborers with buckets that would slowly empty the lake. But after three months, the level had been reduced by only 3 meters, 10 feet, and only a small amount of gold was recovered, not enough to continue, and so this was abandoned, they stopped. And that was not the end of the story for Lake Guatavita. In 1580, so that's 40 years later, 
Another attempt was made to dry the lake by cutting a deep notch into the rim of the lake. The notch eventually collapsed, but the level had decreased by 20 meters this time, and more golden ornaments and jewelry were found. Finally, the attempts ended much later, in the early 20th century. This time the lake was drained completely by a, a tunnel dug under it. Only about four feet of mud remained. But only very few pieces were found in this mud, which quickly dried and uh, set like concrete. So it seems the narrative about the Muisca Golden King was not baseless. There was a lake. Gold artifacts were thrown into it. But based on what was recovered along these different attempts, either they did not throw that much gold, or the pieces got lost under the mud, or it was another lake. Meanwhile, the fast conquest of the Incan Empire had uh, advanced, and the Spanish had now reached Cusco. They had seized the capital. It was not specifically to pursue the myth of El Dorado, but in 1541, another expedition departed from Quito, Ecuador, to explore lands to the east that is to say, towards the inside of the continent. Because many natives had talked of the existence of a valley far to the east that would have been rich in gold and cinnamon. Spices were not really the main thing the Spanish searched for in America, but they were still very valuable. It is unclear whether the natives actually believed in the existence of this valley, if it was a legend of theirs, or if the accounts were exaggerated. But in any case, this was another lead to find more gold, and an expedition departed Quito, led by two conquistadors, Pizarro and Orellana. Pizarro was the name of the main conqueror of the Incan Empire, Francisco Pizarro. But in this expedition, that was his younger brother, Gonzalo Pizarro. Gonzalo quit the expedition after many of their soldiers and native porters had died of hunger, diseases or attacks by hostile natives. He let the other leader, Orellana, go on with instructions to continue downstream on a river. This river was one of the many tributaries to the Amazon River. And Orellana went on downstream until he eventually made it to the Atlantic Ocean. They found no gold, no cinnamon, but Orellana had followed the Amazon River, which was named so because of a tribe of warriors that attacked them on their voyage, and either these were women, or their long hair made them think of women, but they named this river Amazon after the Amazon warriors of Greek mythology. So, we are now reaching the middle of the 16th century, and still no El Dorado found. But the legend's credibility was not harmed by this detail, and uh, with good reason. Even if it was not El Dorado, a lot of gold and silver had been seized in the Incan Empire, and it now appeared that the mines of Mexico or Peru and Bolivia, could provide even more. In this land, golden nuggets could turn up on the bed of rivers. There were also New World diamonds and emeralds 
that started to be exploited. South America remained a, a dangerous place where tropical diseases, wild animals or hostile natives could kill even the bravest adventurer. But it was not like it had delivered nothing. Actual treasures could be found there. They had been found. And El Dorado was still waiting, even though no one remembered or knew precisely why this rumor existed or how it had appeared. The persistence of a legend is also something that makes it credible. If people have been searching for something, have believed in something for a long time, it must mean that somehow there is no smoke without fire, and the thing probably exists. Following this logic, it meant that El Dorado just had to be found in regions that had not been well explored yet, and there were still many in the late 16th century. Maybe El Dorado was not in Colombia, not in the Andes, but then it had to be somewhere in the heart of the Amazonian forest, or the plateaus of Guyana, places that were hard to access and very hostile to travelers. In the late 16th century, Rumor had it now that El Dorado was located on a lake, Lake Parime or Parima, a large lake, almost an inland sea, that would have been located somewhere between the south of Venezuela, the north of Brazil, or Guiana. And because there was this tradition of putting hypothetical things on maps, Plenty of maps of the late 16th and 17th centuries featured Lake Parime in different locations. It was actually not the only mythical lake on early maps of South America. Others like Lake Jarayes or Lake Casipa were also featured on maps until it appeared they simply did not exist. So expeditions went in search of Lake Parime, hoping it would lead them to El Dorado. One of the most notable is the expedition of Walter Raleigh in 1594-1595. Walter Raleigh was an important figure of the Elizabethan era in England, the time of Queen Elizabeth I. He was a statesman, a soldier, a writer, and an explorer, who, between other things, played a leading role in early English colonization of North America. He also wrote accounts of his journeys, accounts that were extremely appealing to the readers in Europe, but that also mixed facts and fiction or fabricated elements that embellished them. In two books he published after this expedition to the Guyanas on the Atlantic coast of South America, he embraced the idea that Lake Parime was real and that it was the location of El Dorado. He never went there, but based on accounts he heard, or imagined maybe, he spoke extensively of the lake and the city of El Dorado. He described the lake's dimensions and said that the lake itself was the source of the gold possessed by the inhabitants of El Dorado. Grains of gold would have been abandoned and easy to recover in this lake and its tributaries, according to what he wrote. After his return to England, he sent a lieutenant back to Guyana in search of the city. But it was never found. And again, because he believed it was real, he returned himself in 1617, 
but was now an old man and stayed behind in the Caribbean. When he returned to England, the time of his favor had gone, and he was not much liked by the successor of Elizabeth, King James. He had had conflicts with the Spanish in the New World, when the king had strictly prohibited this, and for this he was tried and finally executed in 1618, which ended a quite extraordinary life. Anyway, his second expedition did not reveal anything new either about the lake or El Dorado. They both remained missing, which was conceivable for a city lost in the jungle, but for an entire lake that at some point was said to be as large as the Caspian Sea, that was becoming hard to believe. Still, other expeditions led by Spanish, English, German or Dutch travelers departed for the same region inland Guiana, south of Venezuela, north of Brazil, at least one every decade in the 17th century, and they found nothing. As the exploration and colonization of South America had turned more methodical now, less regions were unknown. The perimeter where El Dorado could have been located shrank. But it did not disappear. Like Central Africa, South America had large regions that were difficult to access, where the forest could hide almost anything, and where European explorers, who at this point knew very well the myth of El Dorado and its different iterations or locations, could not go easily. And after almost two centuries of search, the idea was increasingly sounding like a joke. This expedition and the search for Lake Parime really died down at the turn of the 19th century, with an extensive and scientific survey of the basins and lake of Guiana, conducted by Alexander von Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt was a German geographer, also an explorer, scholar, who worked a lot on South America, applying scientific principles to his explorations, like Darwin and many naturalists would later do. He concluded that Lake Parime could not exist, but that maybe a confluence of rivers and their seasonal floods could have created a temporary large body of waters that could have inspired the legends of a lake, but that there was no such thing, and also no El Dorado city was found anywhere in this region. So Lake Parime did not exist, or did it? The hypothesis was abandoned in the 19th century, and El Dorado was increasingly seen as a legend rather than a clue to a fabulous golden city waiting to be discovered. The city remains mythical to our days, nothing close was ever found, and the meaning of El Dorado, of the term, shifted from a hypothetical place to a concept. It became a synonym for promised land or ultimate prize, which is what the term generally is used for nowadays. But the possibility that the lake actually existed in the past was re-explored in the 20th century with interesting discoveries. First, Geologists noticed that in northern Brazil there was a place where, on all the surrounding hillsides, 
a horizontal line appeared at a uniform level, and this line registered the water level of an extinct lake that existed until relatively recent times. It would have been very sizable, 30,000 square miles, about the size of Austria or South Carolina, and almost the size of Lake Superior. In summary, a giant lake. About 700 years ago, so that would be 200 years before the arrival of Europeans, the lake began to drain. And in 1690, so now that's well after the first Spanish expeditions, and a century after Walter Raleigh, an earthquake is thought to have opened a fault in the bedrock that would have permitted all the water to flow into a river and reach the ocean following the Amazon River. So the lake would have disappeared. But it existed before and probably during these expeditions in search of El Dorado. It seems it was not found then, but its mention by the natives made sense if this was true. And, uh, ironically, the maps of the 16th and 17th centuries that featured the lake might not have been entirely wrong, even though it was put in the wrong place and with an exaggerated size. And even better, people lived nearby. There is a site near the location of this dead lake, Pedra Pintada, known for pictographs from the pre-Columbian era. This is speculative, but maybe they could retrieve gold in the lake, carried by streams and rivers out of the mountains, the Andes, and transported to Amazonia. So maybe there was a base to these stories, after all. These stories that Spanish conquistadors and other explorers heard in Colombia, in Ecuador, in Guiana, that kept the expeditions alive for 200 years and fed the myth of El Dorado in this region. It might not have been that rich in gold, probably not an entire city covered in gold, but maybe there was something there that provided the basis for this legend to prosper, and invites to not dismiss myths as pure inventions or wishful thinking. They can be, but more often than not, they are based on the retelling, or the exaggeration, or the displacement of places and events that did exist, and help understand how the myth was born. We have reached the end of our journey for tonight. I hope you liked it, and it makes you want to know more. I'll be back soon with another story. And in the meantime, you can let go and fall asleep. Or pick another story from my library. Sleep well. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.